So without further ado, um, my name is Amy Traver. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the seventh event of the eight event 2015-2016 Kupferberg Holocaust Resource Center and Archives Colloquia Series. It's titled Gender, Mass Violence, and Genocide. We have one more event to go after this one. It is in May, and it's about Rwanda, so please consider joining us for that event. Today's event, however, is called Forgotten Witnesses, Gender-Based Violence in Asia During World War II. And it brings attention to a long overlooked process of mass violence, the sexual enslavement of women and girls during World War II. More specifically, it focuses on the experiences of comfort women, the more than 200,000 Korean, Chinese, Taiwanese, Indonesian, Dutch, and Filipino women who were kidnapped or deceived and forced into sexual slavery by the Imperial Japanese Army. Today's panelists direct our attention to this process and these experiences through two profoundly impactful symbiotic means, documentary filmmaking and historical analysis. Our first panelist, artist Chung Jin Lee, is a Korean-born visual artist based in New York City. Her documentary film, Comfort Women Wanted, is based on our interviews in seven countries with Asian and European comfort women survivors, as well as a former Japanese soldier. The project, which we are privileged to see excerpts of today, has been presented widely and internationally as public art and in galleries and museums in New York, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Germany, and Russia, as features in media outlets like the New York Times, the Huffington Post, NPR, and the BBC, and in lectures and screenings at universities like Columbia, UC Berkeley, Stanford, and now CUNY Queensborough. Our second panelist, Dr. Jimin Kim, is a program director of the, of the Asian Social Justice Internship Program, which is co-hosted by the Korean American Civic Empowerment and the Kupferberg Holocaust Resource Center and Archives at QCC. That's a mouthful. <laughs> As an aside, again, if you're interested in, that, in the topic that we're discussing today, please consider applying to the fall 26 iteration of the internship program here. Dr. Kim specializes in modern Korean history and the history of US-Korea-Japan relations. Her research interests include modernization, the cultural history of foreign relations, and comparative history of decolonization processes. So in advance of today's presentations, please join me in thanking and welcoming our esteemed panelists. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the introduction, Amy. Thank you all for coming. It is great pleasure to share my work here at the Kerberber Holocaust Research, Research Center and Archives, Queensborough Community College. My artwork, Comfort Women Wanted, explores the issue of 200,000 young women known as comfort women who are systematically exploited as sex, sex slaves in Asia during World War II and increases awareness of sexual violence against women during wartime. The military comfort system was carefully planned, organized, and implemented by the Japanese military on an industrial scale not seen before in modern history. The systematic exploitation is the largest case of human trafficking in the 20th century, yet it never got acknowledged. In Asia, this issue remains taboo and controversial. At the same time, it is almost unknown in the West. I began to pay attention to, attention to the conformation issue because of a front page article in the New York Times on March 8th in 2007. The article was related to Resolution 121, also known as the Conformer Resolution, which was proposed by Mike Honda, Japanese American California congressman. The Asian community in the US worked to pass this resolution, asking Japan to take responsibility for the Conformer issue. Three Conformer survivors, two Korean and one Dutch, testified in the US Congress at the time. One of them said, we used to get raped by 50 soldiers a day. It was her shocking revelation that provoked me to start my conformer project. The resolution was success successfully passed on July 30th in 2007. In my initial reading and research, I was surprised to find out it wasn't only Korean women who got enslaved, 
but many other Asian women and even European women in Asia. I realized this wasn't just a Korean issue, but an important international human rights issue that got forgotten. I would like to pre present I would like to present a brief history of a comfort woman, my research in Asia, and artworks. The military comfort woman system was implemented because of two main reasons. First, prevention of sexual diseases for soldiers. When Japan invaded Siberia in 1918, Japanese prostitutes, so-called comfort women, followed the army. The problem was these women had been working as a prostitutes for many years already, and sexual diseases became a huge problem. The Japanese military was surprised to find that they lost more soldiers because of sexual diseases than in battle. This is the main reason why they targeted young girls and virgins. Second, preventing soldiers from raping local women. This is directly related to the rape of Nanjing in 1937. Over 20,000 Chinese women were raped, were raped by soldiers, and this became a big international embarrassment for Japan. To the Japanese government, this was a publicity problem. It wasn't because they care about women, but they didn't want to lose face internationally. So in order to solve these problems, they systematically kidnapped and deceived young girls all over in Asia. There are three typical methods they used. First, virgin recruitment. At the time, Korea and Taiwan had already been colonized by Japan. In Korea, the Japanese government pressured the young girls to volunteer to, to support Japan's war efforts. Of course, it was never voluntary, it was mandatory. Most of these girls who were forced to, forced to volunteer became sex slaves. Second, kidnapping. In many cases, a truck came to a small town and grabbed five to 10 girls in the streets and drove off. No one knew what happened to them, but girls were disappearing. In one case, it was announced there was a free candy at the train station. So many children went and got kidnapped. Third, deception. Like so many other human trafficking cases, they targeted young girls from very, very poor families. Girls were told they work as nurses or factory workers, but instead, they became sex slaves. The conformal system is the largest case of human trafficking in the 20th century. Today, human trafficking is the fastest growing industry in the world and the second largest business after arms dealing in the 21st century. So the conformal issue is not just about the past, it is very relevant today. These girls were as young as 11 years old, and they're raped by between 10 to 100 soldiers a day at military rape camps known as conversations. According to some Japanese military documents, they were listed as supplies. To the military, there are disposable com commodity and one of many war, war supplies they needed for soldiers. Girls were starved, bitten, tortured, and killed. Only 25 to 30% survived the ordeal. So after learning the history, I decided to go to Asia to meet survivors and to hear their stories. Between 2008 and 2012, I met 21 survivors in seven different countries, including Korean, Chinese, Taiwanese, Indonesian, Filipino, and Dutch conformer survivors, as well as a former Japanese soldier. The reason I travel to all these countries is because I want people to understand the conformant issue, not as a Korean or an Asian only issue, but as an important international human rights issue. First, I went to Korea in 2008. The conformant movement was initially organized by two professors, Professor Chung Hok Yoon and Professor Hyo Jae Lee, in the early 1990s. To Professor Yoon, this issue was very personal. During the war, as a college student at Iwa Women's University in Seoul, she saw many of her classmates forced to volunteer as part of the virgin recruitment. Her parents got very suspicious and convinced her to quit the college. 
This may have saved her as she could have become a Kung Fu man herself. Many years later, she wondered about her friends who were forced to, forced to volunteer. She said, men came back after the war, but the women never came back. So I went out looking for them. She started looking in the 1970s and eventually found the first Korean conformance survivor in Okinawa in Japan in 1980. With Professor Hyo J. Lee, they worked together to bring out the conformance issue internationally. When Kim ak -sun, a Korean conformance survivor, heard about Japan's denial, saying that these women are just prostitutes who had been recruited by civilians to make money, she decided to speak up. She became the first conformant to come out publicly. These are her words when she broke her silence on August 14th in 1991. She said, I'm Kim ak -sun, who was forced to become a Japanese military comfort woman. I made my decision when I saw the articles in the newspapers and on TV. They weren't true. This has to be strained out. I don't know why Japan still lies to us, so I came out. No one told me to do so. I did it on my own. I'm almost 70 years old. I don't care if I die now. I was scared at first. Even if it kills me, I have no regrets. I have to say what I have to say. You must know this happened in the past, but this should never happen again in the future. Her courage inspired so many other women survivors to speak out, including Jem Rob O'Haran, a Dutch conformist survivor living in Australia. When I had lunch with Jen in Australia in 2011, she told me, I watched Kim ak speaking out on TV in my, in my living room, and I thought if Kim ak could do it, I could do it too. Kim ak was an ordinary woman who spoke out for herself and for women everywhere. This is called the Wednesday demonstration. Every Wednesday since 1992, people gather with the survivors in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul to protest demanding justice. The first time when I went there, it was monsoon season in Korea. The weather was horrible, very windy and rainy. Yet amazingly, these 80 and 90 old women survivors would show up, rain or shine. As long as they're healthy enough to walk, they will show up sitting at the front door, as you could see in this photo. There were several hundred people. It was very lively, almost like a little festival. Some people made speeches, others performed for the survivors. Korean feminists and activists made a couple of homes for survivors. This is one of them. It's called Shimto, means the resting place. It's in Seoul, and this is the entrance. It's a big house, and several Korean women survivors live there. Another one is called Nanumeji, means the house of a sharing. In Korea, 238 women survivors came out. Now only 44 women, 44 women are still alive. I stayed there for a week and had a chance to get to know some, some of the survivors. Park Wong Nyeon and Lee Yok Sun Helmoni. Helmoni means grandma in Korean. In Asia, any woman old enough to be your grandmother, we refer to as a grandma, even if she's not related to you. Eoksan Hemani in the middle, she has a very vivid memory of, of her past. Kang Il Chu Hemani, Kim Sunok Hemani, Bagok Sun Hemani, Kim Gunja Hemani, Eong Sa Hemani. Eong Sa Hemani was one of the three women survivors who testified in the US Congress in 2007. She has a very strong personality, and you're going to hear her story in the video. At Nanameji, they also have a museum called the Museum of the Japanese Imperial Army's Sexual Slavery and the Center for Peace and Human Rights. This is one of their displays. It's a photo of former military conversations in Asia. This is an example of a room at a conversation in the museum. This is a historical photo of Japanese soldiers waiting in line at a conversation. Another photo of a conversation. Another historical photo of a soldiers at a conversation. After Korea, I went to Taiwan. In Taiwan, 58 women survivors came out. Now only three women are still alive. Liam Hua Chen Ama. Ama means grandma in Taiwanese. She's Taiwanese. 
She's very warm and friendly, and you're gonna hear her story in the video. Meme Lu and Yi Cho Yusu Amas, they're both Hakanese. Shu Ume Wu Ama, she's also Hakanese. Yang Chen Ama, she's Taiwanese. Shu Hyu Feng Hu Ama, she's, a, she's a original Taiwanese. Then I went to Japan. First, I visited WAM, Women's Active Museum on War and Peace in Tokyo. These are activists. This is one of their displays. It's a map of locations of conversations all over in Asia. With activist support, I interviewed Mr. Kaneko, a former Japanese soldier. In 2010, I went to China. In China, about 150 women survivors came out. Now only about 20 women are still alive. First, I met Professor, Professor Suji Lang at Shanghai Normal University. He's the one who started the conformal move, movement in China. At the university, they have a conformal museum. This is one of their displays. It's a Japanese military condom during the war. Then I went to Shanxi to meet Wan Aiwa Danyang. Danyang means grandma in Chinese. She's the first Chinese conformer to come out publicly. She's very tiny, but very feisty. On the left is her adopted daughter. I also visited a few former military conversations, including this one. This is called Dai Salong. Dai Salong was the first conversation ever in Asia. It was established in Shanghai in 1932. In Shanghai alone, there were 158 conversations. This is the entrance. This used to be a guard tower. You can still see some traces of the Japanese past. This is a wooden carving of Mount Fuji. This is a historical, historical photo of a conversation in China. Note the entrance banners. Another one is called Mei Mei Li. This is a huge complex of buildings. It covers three or, three or four blocks. I heard the first one, Dai Salong, was mainly for officers, whereas this one, Mei Mei Li, was mainly for ordinary soldiers. After China, I went to Indonesia. I met Emma Kastima, an Indonesian conformist survivor. She's very graceful, and you're gonna hear her story in the video. She lived with her adopted daughter and grandchildren. This is a former military conversation in Indonesia. When Japan invaded Indonesia, Indonesia had already been colonized by the Dutch over 200 years. This used to be a Dutch officer's home, and the Japanese turned into a conversation. Also, this is where Emma Kastima had been locked in for almost two years. Another conversation, former conversation in Indonesia. As you can see, it's still very Dutch. In 2011, I went to Australia to meet Jem Rolf O'Haran, a Dutch conformist survivor. When Japan invaded Indonesia, Dutch people were first put into prison camps. From there, they selected several hundred Dutch girls and sent them to comfort stations. Jen was one of them. She is the first European conformant to come out publicly. Also, she was one of the three women survivors who testified in the US Congress in 2007. Jen is very elegant and artistic, and you're gonna hear her story in the video. This was my last trip. In 2012, I went to the Philippines. First, I met Lola Julia Polas. Lola means grandma in Filipino. Then I met Lola Fidencia David. She's very outspoken, and you're gonna hear her story in the video. As a result of my trips to Asia, I created, I created a series of artworks. The project is called Comfort Woman Wanted. The title is referenced to as that appear in Asian newspapers during the war. These were in Korean newspapers. On the right, it says, military conformer wanted. On the left, it says, conformer wanted immediately in a large scale. When there are not enough volunteer prostitutes through the ad campaigns, both Asian and European women in Asia were kidnapped or deceived and forced into sex slavery. So this is an important historical reference because this is how it all began. 
My artworks involve at like billboards, street posters, audio video installation, and a recreation of a military conversation. This was at the Intro Women Artist Biennial in Korea in 2009. In the middle, there is a portrait of a Taiwanese conformist survivor. Her name is Mei Chen. This photo was uh, taken by a Japanese soldier during her enslavement at a conversation. She is surrounded by gold leaf, like a saint's halo in a Renaissance painting. I wanted to honor their courage to speak out. So if the first one is a young woman around the time of her enslavement, this is a woman now. A silhouette of an aged conformance survivor against a black and white photo of her current home. And here, I wanted to explore the idea of home. Of those who survived, many never went back home because of what was perceived as their shameful past or they were ostracized from their families and communities. In the conservative society at that time, women's chastity was considered the most important thing. So in here, I wanted to create a sense of loss. Outdoor billboard installation, indoor audio installation. A space gallery in Cleveland, Ohio in 2011 at like billboard. A street poster with a QR code. Indoor installation. Here's a part of a multi-channel video installation in the gallery. Two videos of the women and of the soldiers are projected on opposite walls. This is a video of the woman. At 1A Space Gallery in Hong Kong in 2012. This is a video of, of the soldier which was pro projected at floor level. In 2013, I presented public art throughout New York City. In May, an art display in Chelsea was presented in collaboration with the New York City Department of Transportation's Urban Art Program. One side is in English with a QR code. This is a portrait of a Jen when she was 19 years old, right before the war. The other side is in Chinese, a portrait of a Mei Chen. In September, phone booth posters in English, Korean, Chinese, and Japanese were presented at major sites in New York City in Times Square, post in English with a QR code. In Koreatown, poster in Korean and English. On the left is a portrait of Lee Yong Salmani when she was 18 years old right after the war. On the right is a portrait of Jen when she was 19, 19 years old right before the war. In the Flatiron District. I saw some people scanning the QR code. In Little Tokyo, in the East Village, poster in Japanese. I saw some Japanese students looking at the poster and scanning the QR code. In Chinatown, poster in, in Chinese. In Union Square, at Lincoln Center. This was up during Fashion Week. I saw some people taking photos. A poster at night at Lincoln Center. In November, at Wood Street Galleries in Pittsburgh, in the installation. In December in 2013, I had a pre inaugural exhibit at the Conformal Museum in Taipei, in Taiwan. There are four parts. First, the entrance. As people walk into the space, they can see 53 Taiwanese, Taiwanese Conformal survivors' names in Chinese projected on a floor flag. At the same time, they can hear the audio of a woman singing in multiple languages, which creates a sense of a universality. The second part is at like prints in multiple languages. Here's the third part. This is a recreation of a military conversation based on historical references. Outside, welcoming and regulation banners are hung from floor to ceiling, creating walls. During the war, entrance banners at military conversations welcomed and attracted soldiers. The text in Japanese says, official military hometown conversation. Another one says, Japanese girls dedicating their hearts and bodies in service. Of course, they're not really Japanese. Another one says, grand welcome to victorious, courageous soldiers. This is a conversation regula regulations banner in Japanese. Inside, three videos of former military, military conversations are projected. A video of Dai Salong in Shanghai is projected on the window. 
a video of Indonesian conference stations is projected on a kimono belt on a tatami bed. A video of Mei Mei Li in China is projected on a washing bowl. On the wall, Japanese name, name plaques are hung. Girls are forced to wear kimonos and use Japanese names. It explores the idea of erased ethnic identity. The artificial made up Japanese names contrasts with their real Chinese names at the entrance to the exhibit. A view from outside. The last part is a multi-channel video installation. This is a video of the woman in Chinese. The opposite side is a, is a video of the soldier in Chinese. At the same time, I presented public art throughout Taipei City. Lightbox display at Longshan Subway Station, at Mingguang Subway Station, at Nangang Subway Station. I also displayed 20 small posters at different locations. Outdoor public art at a slide bookstore near the Taipei National University. I would like to say a few last words. The Japanese government must confront the past and acknowledge the wrongdoing rather than trying to hide it. Their continued denials insult the survivors and only serve to undermine Japan and isolate it from the international community. Nonetheless, attempting to analyze this issue from the perspective of individual nations and their pride misses the point. We must understand the conformant issue not based on nationalism, but from a humanistic point of view. This is not about nation against nation. This, this is about what women are going through during wartime, but it's never talked about. This is about an important international human rights issue that got forgotten. We don't learn about the Holocaust to hate Germany or black slavery to hate white Americans in this country. We remember so we don't repeat the same mistake again. The acknowledgement of the conformant issue will help women everywhere in every nation and culture. Also, I hope we can change our perception of these women. I, as I travel to many countries in Asia, I saw so much shame surrounding this issue. Often people look at them as broken flowers that we feel sorry for, or our shameful past that we all want to forget about. It was truly inspiring to meet them and a great honor. They are really, really amazing people, so strong, resilient, and courageous survivors, at the same time, loving and caring grandmas. I hope we remember them as a source of our inspiration and empowerment. They dare to tell us extremely, extremely difficult personal stories so we don't forget. Now I would like to present the video based on interviews with the survivors. They talk about their experiences at military conversations as well as their hopes and dreams. Also, they sing their favorite traditional songs. This video looks at the history through the memory of the survivors. These are the stories and voices of the survivors. G. 
女の子方は着物着てるでしょね着物ね着てるでしょところがね女の子方はこうやって悪いんだけどさこうやってだけこの男の人はこう立ってやってやるだけだから次から次ですよ女の人はこうやって寝たままこうやってタバコを吸ってる男の人はこの中入ってちょこちょこってやってそれで終わりだから10分か15分な早いですよこう抱き合ってチューするとかなんか絶対ないする時間がないわかりますはいこれがね慰安婦のねだ1日に 1, 1日に男の兵隊をね50人も100人も相手にするとそこなんですよそうしないとねここがね一時こう終わったからって紙でこう拭くでしょ今度ここがこう腫れ上がっちゃうだから同じ人絶対それやらないこのままずーっと10人でも100人でもこれもずーっとだから希望を言えばね私たちが戦争で行ったことを二度と戦争をさせたくないと。I'm 88 years old and my name is Jeanne, Jeanne Ruff, or her beautiful childhood growing up in Indonesia that used to be the Dutch East Indies, Dutch colony. And、um, when the Japanese invaded、uh, the Dutch East Indies and invaded Java, that was a, the end of an era in my life. Because all the Dutch people were put into Japanese prison camps. And I was in a Japanese prison camp for the next three and a half years. So one day、uh, was another inspection. We soon realized that this was a different inspection because they said that all the young girls from 18 years and up had to line up in the compound. Until in the end, there were 10 girls left of their choice. And I happened to be one of those 10. There was a truck waiting for us to be taken away. We didn't know where we were going. Our mothers were all screaming and crying, and you know, it was just absolutely terrible.、Um, it was quite a long drive, and it stopped in front of a large colonial style house. We were so scared, we all hunted together in the one big bed at night. The next night, we realized. That we were in a brothel because the Japanese, a Japanese officer came in that day and told us we were in this house for the sexual pleasure of the Japanese military. We were turned into military sex slaves. <laughs> ที่สีลอกเพียงเมียนตามหันทางสีขีบังมีนิสัยบังบังโอ้โหเช่นว่าตอนวัดเสียนิสัยอ่ะอูชิวเดียวกันอะไรทักซึ่งอ่ะอ่ะมึงก็ว่ากาดินบุบุคุยว่าบุฮะตัวหนังทั้งตาปอใจใส่ทั้ง
Saya emas kastima, emas kastima, emas kastima, umur 80, satu, dah. lebih 80 lebih, ke belanja, ya. ketemu sama depan, terus dibawa, terus dibawa tuh kalau ke mobil, terus dibawa nanti sebut nanti kali anjo, kali anjo sebut nanti kekumpulan perempuan dari anjo, ya. Belanjo ya di tempat perempuan ke. Apa ini bawa kalian tu? Kumpulkan nanti dikerja ke ini kasih kerja. Besi kumpulkan tunggu saminggu tunggu balik sarotor dulu. Balik sarotor lama-lama tadi jual 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 di Jepang di banyak Jepang dikerjain cerita. Jadi orang terkuduk seorang seorang di banyak tentara tentara Jepang datang gitu tak? Jadi cakap. Bukan disuruh kerja dikerjain, itu macet. Usah tak aduh, usah. Aduh, sakit hati saya tanya. Buat lagi, ayah nunggu mampeleng, ayah nunggu gitu ya. Aduh, sakit hati tanya. Saya nggak mau panjari dari tadi, nggak mau. Tai ni susah, tio mau cuan. When 就是就是或者就是一个都是，那九年或者都，我要给中国把这个整理拿回来，我要坚持，要把这个在官司要做个超台，那就在做先，那就在决心。Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Jimin Kim. My presentation is about compare women and their stories from um, historian's perspective. She um, approached to this issue from artist perspective. And I will introduce the historical background, the procurement process, life at, at the conference station, reveal the truth, including recent events, an Asian social justice program at this center, Holocaust Center. Kampar women's system was a sexual slavery system created and maintained by the Japanese imperial military before and during World War II. And before we begin, I'd like to introduce several terms referring to this issue. Kampar women is the most familiar and common term for us in the English-speaking world. It is a euphemism used by the Japanese military, and naturally many feel that it is not a proper term to refer to um, the comfort women issue system, and uh, because of the stark contrast between the original uh, 
meaning of the term comfort and the course to labor that these victims experienced. Dutch survivors, when they, they testified, rejected the term comfort women because what they experienced had no relations to the concept of love, sympathy, um, or compassion that the term, term comfort implies. Uh, voluntary, voluntary corpse was another common term in the early days. Uh, the full name was Korean Women's Volunteer Labor Corps for, for the case of Koreans. During the war mobilization period, the Japanese recruited young Koreans to work in mun munitions factories. It was a volunteer group in the names only, and uh, those girls were forcibly mobilized in many cases. And there were different kinds in the corps, and Compound Women Group was one of them. So uh, it may be misleading to use, use this term to refer to Compound Women system. Furthermore, this term has the nuance of consent and willing participation. In the 1990s, the term forced prostitution was occasionally used, but it is not a proper term either. It obscures the terrible gravity of the crime, it suggests a level of voluntarism, and it stigmatizes its victims as immoral or used goods. Scholars have pointed out that all of those terms above uh, reflect the view of the Japanese only, not the uh, view of the victims. To emphasize the fact that those women were recruited and traded uh, against their will, um, currently the international community, such as UN and scholars, uh, use this term, military sex slaves or military sex, sexual slavery. And this term implies that this issue doesn't have a nature of prostitution via a private contract, nor this issue can be explained as voluntary sacrifice by citizens for their country. Compared women were forced into sexual slavery by the state, and they were victims of collective sexual violence. So uh, let me briefly explain historical background. In 1895, Taiwan became a colony of Japan. Um, Taiwan, um, Formosa, the island of Formosa is the old name for Taiwan. And uh, in 1910, Korea became a colony of Japan. Japan controlled Taiwan and Korea until 1945 at the end of World War II. During World War II years from 1941 to 1945, Japan and uh, Nazi Germany and Italy formed the Axis powers. Japanese leaders' vision from, from the late 1930s and during the war was this. They understood that the world was divided into large regional blocks, such as regions um, dominated by Nazi Germany and those under the Soviet Union and so on. And in Asia, Japan proposed a vision of great East Asian co-prosperity. And uh, it aims to solidify all the Asian peoples under the Japanese leadership, as you can see from these posters. This vision justified Japan's aggressive moves into Chinese continent, Southeast Asia, South uh, Eastern Asia, and the Pacific. And um, in 1937, uh, there was an incident called Nanjing Massacre, or Rape of Nanjing. Uh, it was massacre of civilian Chinese, Chinese civilians and atrocities against Chinese women. And there were so many rape cases by Japanese soldiers, and incre this increased the venereal disease among the soldiers. The leaders of the Japanese army were concerned about this and uh, devised the comfort station system within the military bases. Another justification was the prevention of rape in uh, local communities. And this system also aimed to encourage effective military activity and enhance morale of soldiers. We have several official and unofficial documents to prove that, that this system, comfort women's system, was planned and initiated by the Japanese military. 
This is part of a diary of a senior staff officer in Shanghai. He wrote that uh, recently I have heard a lot of uh, stories, including some soldiers wander around seeking women. To solve this problem, he uh, mentions that we decided to introduce various measures. He doesn't specify the comfort station system, but um, in this and in other documents, uh, it is clear that they uh, were planning to establish comfort stations. And there are other uh, documents that the uh, high, officer, high officials in the military uh, decided to set up comfort stations in Shanghai and other um, areas in China. And they sent orders to the junior staff. And the junior staff uh, were to take charge of this task. It confirms that the establishment of army comfort stations were initiated by top ranking officers of the Japanese forces in Shanghai. Although we have a limited number of official documents available now, we have documents enough to prove that um, it was systematically planned by the military. And also, uh, there is another document um, showing that the Ministry of War was aware that the procurers interested by army units were almost kidnapping young girls. And, um, from an interview, um, we can see that uh, methods for setting up comfort stations were being taught at the Army's accounting school around 1939. So it means that they um, discussed about how to set up the comfort stations, and um, they estimated the endurance of the women rounded up local areas and the rate at which they would wear out. Such things they discussed at the school. And it means that the setting up of um, comfort stations was even more systematic than it is generally thought. This is a table of number of comfort stations and comfort women um, in East Central China from uh, 1938 to 1939. Um, this information on this table was obtained from various documents prepared between um, these, yeah, um, 1938 and 1939 by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan. But the number of Chinese company women is not known. And this data um, do not reflect the true situation. Um, but from these statistics, it is clear that conference stations were established not, not only um, in major cities, but also in small and medium-sized cities as well. There were three kinds of military conference stations. Permanent stations attached to large supply bases located in major cities. Semi-permanent stations attached to large army units such as divisions, brigades, and uh, regiments. And thirdly, temporary stations um, attached to small battalion size units in the uh, front lines in uh, war zones. And abducted Korean company women at, um, at the, the end of the war um, were sent for the third type in the front lines. And also there were um, comfort stations for laborers near factories producing war materials. Um, it is estimated that uh, up, up to 200,000 women were taken to comfort stations. And uh, as we don't have um, official, we don't have many official documents related to um, number of comfort women uh, estimates vary from 20,000 uh, to 200,000. And those victims were from um, Korea, China, Taiwan, the Philippines, Indonesia, and there were even Dutch women uh, from the Dutch East Indies. But the majority, about 80%, were Koreans, and uh, they were young and unmarried girls. Um, 
At first, Kumpar women were Japanese prostitutes who volunteered for such service. But um, Japan continued military expansion, and the military found, soon found itself a short of Japanese volunteers, and they turned to local population, especially in colonies and occupied territories, to uh, coerce women into serving in these stations. Um, so the procedure um, of rounding up uh, compound women was like this. Military selected middlemen to procure compound women. And then middlemen advertised in newspapers circulating in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and other countries. And uh, they also uh, hired agents to procure, mobilize uh, girls from local villages. And uh, in Korea and Taiwan, those were colonies of Japan, deception was the most common tactic um, used in th those areas. And typically, a daughter of a poor peasant family responded to a false promise of employment as a factory worker or nurse because it seemed like a good job opportunity. Um, the Changjin already uh, introduced this kind of advertisement in newspapers. And uh, in this newspaper, it says um, company women wanted, and uh, they are mobilizing company women, but they uh, don't include any details what the company woman is and uh, what the job, uh, job description would be. And uh, um, the Japanese authorities uh, authorities uh, also selected private operators to manage the conversations. The Japanese military and police also provided cooperation in the mobilization process. The Japanese police force also used intimidation and violence. Kidnappings were frequent too. Uh, according to testimony of Moon Pilgi, a Korean survivor, uh, she entered regular school at age nine but her father withdrew her from school and burned all her textbooks, saying women who study become foxes. She suffered from the discrimination against women. Because Moon longed to study, when a Korean man told her that he could take her to a place where she could study and earn a lot of money, she agreed to go. In 1943, Moon was, uh, it, that was in 1943, and she was 18 years old. She left her village in a truck, but the truck stopped in an out of the way spot, and she remembers that a Japanese policeman was standing there. And it, it is likely that the police were secretly aiding agents uh, rounding up comfort women. She was taken to Busan and to China and became a woman. And in the Philippines and in China, kidnapping and abduction were commonly used to procure a women. Those victims were abducted by Chinese, um, Japanese soldiers from home, work, or while, while walking in the street. The duration of captivity was between one and uh, several months. None of the victims were ever paid. Um, I will show you a short video clip from um, our interview with a Filipino company woman survivor uh, in our Asian Social Studies program. Uh, please uh, describe how you were taking to the comfort station. So, while on the highway going to her village, one truckload of soldiers came. And then they they captured Lola, and then she was uh, two soldiers hold her in hands, and then she is trying to resist. But the more she resists, she received some violence from the Japanese troops. She was uh, she was <laughs> so the Japanese soldiers. Um, slapped slap her in the face several times and she was uh, they were holding her hands and then they boxed her in the stomach so sometimes 
she felt that she lost consciousness, but she can still say that two Japanese soldiers hold her hands and then the uh, other Japanese soldier uh, hold her feet and then they just throw her inside the truck. Okay, um, there are also Dutch uh, company women in Indonesia, about 300 young Dutch women were taken to conference stations from the former Dutch East Indies, uh, currently Indonesia. In early 1944, residents of European descent in Indonesia were interned in the camps under the juris jurisdiction of the Java military administrator. And the Japanese military stations in, um, in Samarang plan to establish new compared to stations and plan to use women in the internment camps as compared women. And um, uh, according to testimony of Jan O'Hearn, she was in the internment camp. And uh, one day in February 1944, Japanese army officers came and ordered that all single girls from 18 and up were to line up. So she was one of them. And 16 girls were separated, and the women in the camp, especially mothers of those girls, tried to resist, but they were pushed aside. So uh, let me explain the involvement of Japanese military and government in uh, this system. We have documents uh, showing that the military and the government were directly involved in this system. One document shows a civilian border owner to the Japanese army headquarters in Korea for permission to transport comfort girls. So um, they could send those comfort women to China and wherever, wherever um, the, to the comfort stations with the permission from the government. And also document, the second document shows that uh, Korean village leaders were ordered to send young girls to participate in important business for the imperial army. And also in cases of the uh, Korean and Taiwanese women sent to uh, China by ship, um, they needed to have this document called travel identity papers uh, similar to passport of today. And these papers were issued by the police stations under the respective governments general. And when the police in uh, Korea and Taiwan issued those papers, they inquired into the occupations, identities, employment, employment histories, period of stay, and uh, purpose of travel of all passengers. It means that the police had every opportunity to become aware of the fact that the coarse surrounding of women was taking place. Um, these are rare photographs of Khmer women. And um, then how about the life at the Khmer station? At the conference station, each woman served 10 to up to 60 or more soldiers a day. Um, if a girl refused to serve, she would be brutally assaulted. And according to the rules of use for military conference stations, acts of abuse against conference women were, were prohibited. But daily violence by conference station operators or soldiers were, was very common. And uh, even when suicide or murder cases occurred, they were neglected in many cases. And when Khmer women died, they were not properly buried, but left or abandoned in the street, according to uh, survivor's testimony. Il Chul Gang uh, is a survivor, Korean survivor, and she said um, those um, dead Khmer women were treated worse than animals. And um, at the military conference stations, the army oversaw every as aspect of operations. And victims were prohibited from going out or only allowed to go out for a specific time or scope. Therefore, it was very difficult for them to escape from these stations. And even if, if uh, they could go out of, of the conference station, they had little idea of, 
about exactly where they were, and they could not speak the local language. And often they were uh, recaptured to the station and harshly punished for escaping. Um, soldiers using military comfort stations usually paid a fee by um, currency coupons to, uh, and compared to women received those coupons to prove how many soldiers they served. They were told that these coupons could be exchanged for money later, but uh, they were mostly managed by comfort station operators, and in most cases, the women actually did not receive any financial rewards at all. Comfort women in the front line had to share the fate of the Japanese soldiers. They were uh, either killed in bombings or of battlefields, or killed during transportation with the sinking of transport ships. This is part of our interview with Ok Sun Lee, a Korean survivor. And these are pictures um, of comfort station and Japanese soldiers um, waiting for their turns outside, outside the comfort station. And uh, the consequences, uh, according to the records of the Japanese military, the purposes to establish those stations were to prevent rapes and to be prevent soldiers from contracting sexual, sexually transmitted disease. But did they achieve these goals? Um, the answer is no and no. Rapes did not stop. Um, the conversation system was a system of officially recognized sexual violence, and it is impossible to prevent, prevent rape on the one hand while officially sanctioning sexual violence on the other. And for sexually transmitted disease, conversations were not only ineffective in preventing the spread of disease, but they actually facilitated the infection of many more soldiers. And um, the conference women's system was violation of, of international laws at the time. Uh, there were several treaties in effect at the uh, start of World War II. Um, established that slavery was an international crime and that forced sex was a form of slavery. Uh, we have, uh, for example, trafficking conventions of uh, 1904, 1910, and 1933, and other uh, conventions. And those, uh, both conventional and customary law provide the first forceful evidence that sexual slavery was a crime well before Japan instituted the system of those um, compared stations. After the war ended, most of the compared women were killed or simply abandoned by the Japanese. And some were rescued or captured prisoners of war by the Allied 
horses and eventually sent home. But most of them were locally abandoned and these victims had to survive on their own uh, or had to find ways to return to their homeland. Even after returning to their homeland, the surviving victims uh, suffered from serious physical and mental after effects. They suffered damages as a result of beating, brutality, infertility, sexually transmitted disease, and so on. And also, they had to suffer from psychological trauma, such as a sense of humiliation, a social stigma, a sense of defeat, depression, and so on. And they were unable to become actively involved in social life and uh, their family relationship. And many of them had to live in poverty. Uh, survivors for, came forward to press their own claims for redress from the early 1990s. But before then, in Japan, uh, those stories about comfort women and comfort association turned up um, in memories, histories, novels, and films. And uh, mostly, they um, appear as a, they, they were treated as fond memories of veterans. And any Japanese military personnel with wartime experience knew the existence of compared women. So it can't be said that people were completely unaware of this issue until the 1990s. Um, the Korean women who survived the war lived mostly in science, silence because of the stigma and many never married. And then in 1991, the first uh, survivor, Kim Hak Soon, uh, came forward to testify. And Korean women's groups issued a statement to demand, demanding Japan an apology and compensation for those survivors. But the Japanese government did not main, make any move to ac acknowledge the military uh, participation in the system. And uh, in the same year, in 1991, uh, Japanese Army's official documents related to this system were found at the National Institute for Defense Studies Library in the US. And those documents showed that the Japanese Army dir directed the setting up of uh, conversations. stations. And those documents were published in Asahi newspaper, one of the uh, Japan's major daily newspapers. And on the next day, uh, the Japanese government publicly acknowledged um, the Japanese military's participation in organizing this system. And uh, the Prime Minister of Japan, who was visiting Korea, apologized at a meeting of top Korean and Japanese leaders. But this move stopped far short of satisfying the demands of the survivors. Uh, first, the Japanese government um, used very ambiguous languages on the role of Japanese government and military in mobilizing the women. And uh, they acknowledged that the Japanese military set up comfort stations, they conducted medical examinations, and uh, they oversaw the management of comfort facilities, but it still maintained that comfort women were rounded up primarily by civilian uh, procurers. And secondly, uh, also the apology was addressed only to Korean women, not to uh, other Asian women. And third, while the government admitted the grave injury was done to the honor of those women, the government response uh, did not go further than an offer of deepest apology and regret. Um, so the the survivors and uh, activists demanded more uh, specific uh, plans like compensation and an outline of steps to be taken to prevent a recurrence of these crimes. But in all of these, it was lacking. There were a uh, Kono statement um, to acknowledge and uh, apologize for this matter in 1993. But this sort of official acknowledgement on the part of Japanese government is not widely shared by Japanese people in general and uh, high officials especially. In 1994, Justice Minister said compared women were licensed prostitutes 
and in 2007, Prime Minister, there is no evidence of coercion um, in mobilizing those women. In 2013, Prime Minister Abe once again denied coercion in recruiting Korean women. And uh, it was even after the 2007 U.S. House of uh, Representatives uh, resolution uh, demanding the apology and compensation from Japanese government. And in 2013, uh, Osaka mayor said Korean women were necessary during the war. So um, Kampa women survivors in Korea um, have continued their rallies, demonstrations outside the Japanese embassy in Seoul since 1992. And in December 2015, last year, South Korea and Japan reached an agreement that aimed to resolve the Kampa women issue. And in the agreement, Japan made an apology and promised an um, $8.3 million payment that would provide care for the survivors. But um, mainstream scholars and survivors consider that the agreement was a political deal to elevate diplomatic, economic, and uh, security ties between the two countries rather than the final resolution reflecting the survivors' voices. It has the same uh, problems as in the uh, former statements like um, Japanese government uh, used very ambiguous languages they, uh, in their involvement in, the, in mobilizing the company women. And also, the apology was never uh, sent to survivors in person. Um, they, it was mentioned in the statement. It was mentioned in uh, their discussion between diplomats, but uh, not directly to the survivors. And the uh, process itself was uh, neglected the voices of the survivors. And also Japanese government um, agreed to provide a fund, but not in a form of direct compensation to the survivors. That means um, they are not going to take legal responsibility for this issue. The agreement marks an important change of the issue, but it is too early to assess its impact. And what is clear is that the agreement should not be the end in securing justice for the uh, former sex slaves. A lesson from the agreement, I believe, that the fundamental and ultimate um, resolution of this issue should come from human rights perspective, not from diplomatic or any other approach. What is more powerful than the political decision is change and awareness of ordinary persons like us in this room. If you change your view and if you uh, awaken with uh, this issue, it has much potential to change the situation. This has been an approach that the Asian Social Justice Program has taken. This program is co-hosted by the uh, Cooperberg Holocaust Center and Korean American Civic Empowerment. We have hosted several events, uh, such as a special exhibition on Kumpel women in 2011 and special talks by Kumpel women survivors. And another important program is Asian Social Justice Internship Program. We have run this program since the fourth semester of 12, uh, 2012 with about uh, 10 students each semester. In this program, we are making efforts to educate the students and public about this issue in order to learn a lesson from history, not to repeat the same mistakes in the future, and also to support the victims to restore their dignity. Student interns learn history of East Asia and war crimes, conversion women issue, and they have an opportunity to interview with the survivors. Um, after the interviews, um, students told me they were very moved with uh, those stories that they could hear directly from the survivors. And one student told me her interview was a life-changing experience. And another student said um, 
This survivor, his interviewer, interviewee, could have been his grandma, and uh, it is very heartbreaking for him. And another student said, um, this um, survivor, Eok Sun, was taken to the conversation station when she was 12, and his little sister is 12, and um, he doesn't know what to do if that kind of thing happens to his little sister. Um, and another student uh, said uh, she has grown, uh, after this program, she has grown not, uh, as, not just as a student, but also as a responsible member of humanity. And uh, so after this program, they naturally become uh, delegates for the victims working, to, working and supporting the survivors. I'd like to conclude my talk with this painting by a former student intern. Gregory was a, a fine art major, and uh, after his interview with the survivor, he was very touched by her story, so he drew this painting entitled Voiceless Past. Uh, it represents a um, comfort woman survivor um, on the left side in her uh, when she was young, when she was taken to conversation, on the right side, she that um, her today, and on both sides, she lost her voice. She is silenced, and um, I think this is a great example how one person with awareness of this this issue can affect many others and um, contribute to preventing recurrence of the same tragedy in our own land. Thank you. Thank you both very much for your comments and for sharing your work with us today. And thank all of you for being here. I'd like to invite any questions. Uh, I'd like to invite any questions that you might have at this point for our speakers, for our experts. And um, they can be questions about the artistic process and also about the research. Thank you. Thank you very much for a really um, impressive uh, collection of artworks and also the background uh, to inform us about this serious issue. And um, I'm a grad student, and I'm personally interested in the uh, post-war process. It, general, and so I have two questions from my perspective. And uh, my first question is that um, actually um, the United Nations, the, the, the countries which won the World War II, uh, conducted the uh, Tokyo War Crime Tribunal. And my question is that uh, the, how do you think the reason why um, the countries or judges uh, didn't take into account of the uh, this uh, comfort woman issue or sexual slavery. And um, the activities are something that kind of damage this uh, tribunal's judgment or challenge the uh, tribu war tribunal process. And would you mind share your thoughts about how this, uh, the post-war period uh, process and also the current um, perspective of, uh, what say, um, activists or human rights advo advocates. And uh, my second question is that um, my colleague um, shared one of the news uh, from probably Yonghap, is that right pronunciation? Yonghap News Agency, uh, touched upon that uh, among 22 comfort, former comfort women, uh, which Korean government interviewed, um, 16 acknowledged that, or acknowledged, or welcomed, or whatever, uh, gave a positive feedback towards the December agreement between um, Korea and Japan, and uh, among so, and 16 kind of gave a positive feedbacks and probably um, the remaining six against. And so how do you think about these feeling of 16 women who gave uh, positive feedbacks to the agreement and whether um, the remaining six comfort women deserve the right 
to say no to these remaining 16 comfort women or uh, I don't know the other 20 comfort women, how, from a, how they think about it, but uh, would you mind sharing your thought? I really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you for great questions. For the first question, um, yes, comfort women issue was not uh, treated at the Tokyo Tribunal. And this was because they, there were company women uh, system was known to many people, but uh, as prosti prostitution system at the time. And there were not official documents proving Japanese military and government were involved, directly involved in this system. And many of the survivors uh, did not come forward to tell their stories yet. So uh, that's the background of uh, the, that. And for the second question, um, uh, I, I don't think I can comment on this issue exact, exactly without uh, reading the first story and how the Korean government interviewed with Korean uh, compared women survivors because as I know com many of the compared women are they, their health uh, condition is very bad and they um, there are several survivors that we able we we are able to interview with but uh, rest of them um, they cannot even have interview with uh, us and I Yes, uh, I think many of them in their, their late 70s and 80s and even 90s, and um, it's possible that they welcomed, uh, welcome any move from Japan, any positive move from Japan, but I, uh, honestly, I can uh, make comments on this uh, without reading the first story. Well, one thing I would like to say about the um, agreement uh, in December agreement between Japan and Korea, the reason it is not acceptable um, and most these Korean women survivors, they reject it is because they're not accepting legal, most, uh, legal responsibility. And they call it, it basically saying it's a morally, they're accepting responsibility, but that's just not enough. Um, and they net, never officially acknowledge their, uh, the government's involvement. Another thing is um, so-called, you know, the money they um, were supposed to give, it, give out to um, the women survivors, it was called donation. It wasn't a legal compensation. So it is very important to have that compensation is not about money, but it is very important to have this illegal um, compensation because the problem with the um, this apologies is that uh, in the past uh, um, you know some Japanese politicians uh, apologized it but the problem is it was again considered as individual apologies so um, you know so then the next prime minister next uh, diplomat would say well that was that person's uh, personal opinion it has nothing to do uh, with the, our Japanese government so that's why it is very important to have that uh, sincere apology but legal compensation excuse me I don't know if I'm correct never mind I'm sorry for my poor English, but uh, for this question, I just heard about some news in China. I came from China. Actually, uh, for most of the comfort women in China, they, they require the official apology from Japan, not for compensation, but the Japan, the government, they show very bad attitude against the comfort women. They just think about, that's a money issue. You 
you Chinese people just want the money. So okay, we give you the money compensation. But uh, I remember there's a new says about the comfort women, they refused to get the compensation. And the government fought back, fighting back with such comments, oh, you want more money. So I think basically Japan government, um, they don't have attitude. Even the society, they just skip this history. They cut it off from the education. Even the, the young kids, the children, they don't know what happened in the past with this country. So comparing to G Germany, I really, uh, personally, I, I really re respect Germany. Because you know, uh, we are a human being. We did mistake in the past, but we can learn, we can teach, educate our next generation to learn the lesson from the past. So the Germany, all the whole nation, they show very good attitude. Even I just read some story from a book from a Chinese mom, but she, she married to a Germany ambassador many, many years ago. Her two young boys, they complain, mom, why we, as a young generation, we should show such a big historical responsibility because we are the new generation. It's not our responsibility to sh show the burden from the past. But the whole country, the, the national education shows very good attitude to let the young generation know we did something wrong. We have to pay. But Japan is different. Thank you. Do you want to reply to her comments about the way that education is unfolding around this topic in the US or abroad? Uh, yes, it is. Um, education is important part of uh, survivors' demand to, toward the Japanese government. They demand the Japan uh, educate their young generation about this issue and this tragedy not to be repeated in the future. And, um, for the current Japanese um, government attitude toward this issue, the important fact is that Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe, um, or, um, ab even after the uh, Korean-Japan agreement in last year, and in January this year, he comment again commented that uh, there is no evidence of coercion in mobilizing uh, company women. So that's... Um, their attitude to dealing with this issue. And Jimin, if I understand correctly, we actually have excerpts in textbooks in the United States acknowledging the uh, comfort women. Yes. So in the United States, we're educating about this history in our textbooks, in our primary and secondary schools, but it's not happening mm -hmm. in Japan, from what I understand. Yes. Yeah, I think also it's not just uh, only in Japan. Uh, you know, as I travel to many other countries in Asia, a lot of countries, uh, Asian countries, uh, the government or, I mean, there's no education about this issue either. So it's not, unfortunately, um, you know, because a lot of governments, they're corrupt and, you know, basically they're abandoning their own women as well. They're, you know, they're selling out these women uh, in the name of uh, uh, diplomacy and e economy. So, certainly, I think that uh, you know, including Taiwan, uh, Indonesia, and, uh, and many other countries, um, you know, there isn't much education about this. And I mean, one thing I have to say also. I know there are a lot of Chinese people care about this, but the the Chinese government is not really, you know, trying to support and resolve this issue either. You know, um, but at the same time, I mean, again, I, I think there is a general attitude about okay, these poor, uneducated women, do we want to risk our economy for these mm -hmm. women? I think that's a general attitude uh, in Asia. Um, I mean, I'm hoping 
you know, China is doing well in terms of, a, you know, economy, and I hope they could work with, uh, well, I wanted to say the South Korean government, <laughs> but at this point, I mean, the agreement they made with the Japan was just completely unacceptable. So, but if not the governments, I think it has to be the people, you know, because even in Korea, the women founders of feminists, these women who started the movement, um, they did it without Korean government support. Uh, at the time, Korea was under dictatorship, and it was a sexist government. They couldn't dare to talk about it or even turn it into a movement, but they did. And eventually, as Korea became more uh, democratic country in the early 1990s, so I think uh, we can't just ask the government to do everything. If they can do it, we have to do it. Hi, first of all, I wanted to thank you both for your presentations. Um, I think uh, the research and um, the work was really impressive and I really enjoyed um, learning about your respective uh, research and projects. Um, Changjing in particular, I think, um, as an artist, uh, the extent of interviews that you did and the scope of it, as well as the various ways that in which you presented it to the public and engaged the public was really um, impressive. Um, I had two questions, one about censor censorship around this issue in Japan. Um, you know, I understand that the Japanese government not only um, has censored uh, this topic in terms of um, the way this history is told or definitely not told in Japanese uh, textbooks, but also in the media. Um, I know there have been some um, cases where a photographer's work has been censored. Um, They've also tried to censor the erection of memorials outside of Japan. Um, there was a comic book exhibit in Korea, or in France, I believe, of Korean artists um, who were covering this topic that they tried to shut down as well. Um, and so I'm wondering whether you tried to, um, you've shown your work throughout Asia, have you um, made attempts to show it in Japan and what has been the response? Um, and then also a question just about um, kind of drawing on this, the conversation about education in the textbooks. Um, personally, as a Japanese person, I'm very cynical about the Japanese government right now. And I don't believe that there will be a, any acceptance of legal responsibility um, in the lifetime that these women are still alive. Um, what do you think is the most effective way to engage young Japanese people. Um, generally, I think, you know, this is a very broad statement, but um, there is extreme amount of ignorance about Japanese war crimes history, um, and also just a lack of interest in engaging with that history. Um, so what would be an effective way to try to engage those young people? Um, about Showing in Japan, uh, actually, um, I was kind of invited uh, to present my work at the um, to, uh, Kyoto Peace Museum um, a few years ago, and there were some um, Japanese Korean uh, scholars and activists. Also, they wanted to work together to make this happen. But um, basically, you should say we would love to, and we have a funding and everything, but it would be too too dangerous for you to come to Japan right now with the Abe and everything. It just, yeah, so unfortunately that's uh, what's happening. Um, about educating Japanese young kids, I think, you know, we need, it, we need international support. We need international education and, um, you know, acknowledging this issue, honestly, I don't think Japan is willing to accept this history because they're in a way very comfortable in a kind of position that, you know, um, you know, they were taught they were actually, you know, it was like victims of a World War II because of a Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. And of course in here is also a Japanese American with their internment uh, camps and stuff like that. So I think, I mean, I think that's why it is really important to ha have international support and dialogue. 
then eventually kind of Jap Japan has to open up to that. So, I mean, because like Korean's been working on this for over 20 years, uh, but the problem is then it became just national conflicts, you know, just like two countries can stand each other. So I think the view is very narrow, and it's like Korean kids are educated, but Japanese kids are not. So, so then when Koreans talk about it, Japanese kids are like, you know, they feel like, you know, they're just being attacked by Koreans, you know, with no apparent reason. So, yeah, I think it has to be international, and I think especially important to be educated and then uh, getting support from the U.S. because I don't know how much Japan cares about Korea, but they certainly care about America. <laughs> so. Um we have gone a little bit over time, and I want to be respectful of uh, folks' schedules, but I also want to be respectful of all of the questions that remain. So if you wouldn't mind if people stayed a little bit later and asked questions more interpersonally, and I'd like to invite you to do that with our guests. But for everybody else who has somewhere else to go, uh, please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists for their time. And please don't be shy to ask your questions on a more personal basis. Thank you. Come on up.